Okay, so we are wrapping up this uh, section on uh, waves on, on Schwarzschild background. I've talked a little bit about the quasi-normal modes, very briefly actually just giving the, the main results. So what we learned from the quasi-normal modes was that um, the Schwarzschild spacetime is um, st stable in a certain sense. This particular kind of stability is called modal stability because you consider certain modes and look at, uh, at the way in which they decay or not decay. In this case, they do decay. And this means that the, that the space time is, um, the Schwarzschild space time is static. Uh, by the way, I made a stupid mistake. Of course, the, the bigger black holes um, have bigger damping times. I was confused uh, because you asked me about Hawking radiation. With Hawking, it's the other way around, right? The small things, they have, they have strong Hawking radiation and the big things little. With the, with the decay of the perturbation, it's the other way around. So I said that stellar black holes, if you hit them with a hammer, that then the damping time would be something in the order of milliseconds. So for supermassive black holes, it's about six orders of magnitude bigger. So it's something like thousands of seconds. So that's hours or so. Yeah? So if you hit the thing at the center of our galaxy uh, with a hammer, then you have to wait for an hour or so until the perturbation has, has died down. And uh, well, for the small ones, for the mini black holes, if they do exist, uh, the decay time is very, very short. It's ridiculously short, yeah. Does it de depend on the size of the hammer? <laughs> the question was if it is, uh, depends on the size of the hammer. Well, uh, of course, everything is restricted to perturbation, which are so small that you can use a linearized theory, mm -hmm. yeah? That's the only restriction. So, uh, apart from this, uh, it depends only on the mass. Yeah, every, for Schwarzschild, it depends, uh, it, it scales with the mass. So for other black holes, which also have a spin or a charge, then of course it also depends on the other parameters. Okay, so this was one thing, the quasi-normal modes, and the other thing was uh, uh, what I wanted to, um, to show with the help of the Rechevilla equation, uh, was uh, the fact that there's no super radiance. So that if you, if you uh, consider scattering uh, at a black hole, so you send something in, and then the question is, is it possible that you get more back than you have sent in? That's one, what one would call super radiance, but for the Schwarzschild space time, this will not occur. And in order to derive this, uh, this uh, result, uh, I have to recall these, these basis elements, which I call the, the in mode and the out mode. Uh, they were characterized by their uh, asymptotic behavior near the horizon. So the in mode comes with a minus sign. So this is a, a, a Rechevilla tortoise coordinate. So I have now a real omega. So I assume that I have, yeah, for the quasi-normal modes, we considered complex omegas. But for scattering theory, we consider real omegas. So the things are just oscillating with a real frequency omega, no damping. So, and here is a plus. And this was characterized or this characterizes uh, um, uh, the, um, uh, the solutions near the horizon. So I said this, actually one can write down these basis elements explicitly in terms of converging sums. They are, uh, they, these, uh, these converging sums give the so-called Hoyne-C function, the uh, solution to the confluent Hoyne equation but I have not, uh, have not worked this out here. So what I've written down here is only the asymptotic behavior. If I approach the horizon, if I approach, um, if R star approaches minus infinity, then they behave like a wave, uh, like a, yeah, a harmonic wave traveling in the, uh, in the negative R star direction and here in the positive R star direction. So if you have our potential, the Rechevilla potential, at this shape, so it's a potential well which goes to zero in, uh, for R star to plus infinity and minus infinity. And here you have something which travels in the negative uh, R star direction and here something in the positive R star direction. So the, the in mode would be something like this and the out mode would be something like this. Yeah? And out of these two things, by forming linear combinations, you can write down any solution to the Rechevilla equation. The Rechevilla equation is a second order linear differential equation. So if you have two uh, linearly independent uh, solutions, then you can write down every solution as a linear combination of them. And then we also have had another basis where we considered the asymptotic behavior for R star to plus infinity. 
and that's what one calls the down mode and the up mode. Could also call them in and out, but you have to distinguish the two things <laughs> uh, in one way or other. So it has become common to call them the down mode and the up mode. So this is the same expression asymptotically, uh, but now at the other end of the, uh, of the R star axis. Oops. For R star to plus infinity. So we have this goes up and this goes down. Now both things are basis, um, uh, are basis uh, solutions for our second order differential equation. So every solution, in particular the other pair of solutions, uh, must be um, uh, uh, um, um, must be given uh, as a sum of these two. Yeah? So for instance, I can write this as a linear combination of these two, or this as a linear combination of these two. And the question is, what are the coefficients which occur? In general, and that's what makes the story so complicated, in general, the in mode is not just the same as, a, as the up mode, but rather really a linear combination of the up and the down mode. Yeah? Although the asymptotic behavior is the same, yeah? But uh, this, uh, they, they do not fit, they do not uh, fit together. So there's really, one is really a, li a, re a linear combination of the other two. And the coefficients which occur here, they are difficult to determine. There are no easy uh, um, yeah, analytic expressions. But the absolute square of the coefficients, this satisfies an easy equation. And that's what I want to derive. And this, from, this, from this relation alone, we will deduce that there's no super radiance. So first of all, we observe, because we have a real omega, it means that this is a complex conjugate of this here, right? And this is a complex conjugate of this here. So we have a real omega. This means that RLO is just RLI conjugate complex. Yeah, I use an, an overbar here for the complex conjugate. Yeah, the asymptotic behavior is uh, just related by complex conjugation. And because I have a linear differential equation, then it must be true for the entire solution. Yeah? So if on a certain interval, uh, or in a certain asymptotic, uh, asymptotic limit, one is a, a complex conjugate of the other, then it must be uh, on, the, on the entire domain. And uh, similarly here, RLU is RL down bar. This is not true for complex omega. Yeah, you have to be careful. When you discuss quasi-normal modes, then these relations do not hold. But for, uh, for the scattering problem where we have real, real omega, it's true. And then it must be, it must be that, for instance, RLI is a linear combination of these two. And I have, I have coefficients, complex coefficients, of course, RLD plus BL RL up. And as I said, I will not be able to determine the AL and the BL here explicitly. There are, there are formulas for these uh, in terms of, um, of, uh, of uh, series expressions and things like that. And of course, you can calculate them numerically. They depend on omega, by the way. Yes, of course, everything depends on omegas. We have different coefficients for different omegas. So uh, yeah, you can, can look them up in, uh, in some uh, in some, some tables which have been to produce for the Schwarzschild space time. But that's not what I want to do. I want to derive a very simple formula, and it's really surprisingly simple, which relates the square of AL to the square of BL. And uh, yeah, let's see, how should we do this? What, what we use is a Vronsky de determinant. Yeah, the Vronsky, as they say in English. Uh, I think everybody remembers this. So if we have a uh, yeah, this is the so-called Wronski determinant, or Wronskian, as they say in English, just if I have two solutions to a second-order linear differential equation, then I can form this determinant. And I will do this here for Li, RLI and RLO. So, so this is defined in the following way. So for the solutions RLI and RLO, you can do this for any two solutions of your differential equation. And it's defined in the following way. It's a determinant. It is RLI, RLO in the first row. And in the second row, you write the derivative. So in our case, this is a derivative with respect to R star. RLI, oops, dy, dr star, RLO. 
And this has a remarkable property, and that's very easy to, to demonstrate. It's a linear differential equation of second order, and in this case, the, the Vronskian is a constant. Yeah? And that's easy to see. So if I consider d by ds of this Vronskian, then what is this? Well, it's a derivative of this, de of this determinant. And the determinant is RLI, RLI d by d r star uh, RLO minus RLO d by d r star RLI. Okay. And now I calculate this derivative with a, with a product rule. So I first uh, take the derivative of this term here, RLI times second derivative of RLO. And then I take the derivative of this term here, minus RLO, second derivative of RLI. And then I get two additional terms, where this, uh, this is not d by ds, but d by dr star, of course. Uh, if this derivative hits this term, and the term where this derivative hits this term, but this is the same with a minus sign in between. Yeah, so these other, the other two terms drop out. So that's the result. And well, we have our differential equation, in our case, a Rachevila equation. So what is this? And both, both uh, elements are solutions to the Rachevila equation. So RLI is what? So this was, uh, here's a plus sign. We had it with a minus sign on the left-hand side. So this is a potential times RLO. Uh, minus omega squared over c squared RLO, right? This second derivative, it's a second derivative, oops, uh, nonsense. This second derivative is, if I re uh, recall the Rachevila equation, is this expression here, yeah? This minus this plus this equals zero according to the Rachevila equation. And here exactly in the same way, minus RLO VL RLI minus omega squared C squared RLI yeah, and you see the terms drop out, right? RLI, RLO, RLI, RLO, RLO, RLI, RLO, RLI, so this gives zero. All terms drop out. So the derivative, not with respect to S, with respect to R star. The derivative of this thing is zero. This means this is a constant. Yeah? And this is a general result that holds for all linear second order differential equations. Whenever you have two solutions, you form the Vronskian, and then the derivative is zero. So it's, a co it's constant along the, yeah, the, uh, the axis where your function is defined. And uh, well, we, that, that's what we, what we will use now. So in order to uh, evaluate, um, as a, uh, to get some information on these coefficients AL and BL. So what I will do now is I write this condition, that this is constant. I, write, uh, I conclude from this that in the limit R star to minus infinity, it must give the same as in the limit R star equal to plus infinity. Yeah? If it's constant, then it's in particular the same for both limits. So this implies Limit of R star to minus infinity, RLO, RLI is the same as the limit R star to plus infinity. Omega RLO, RLI. I have written it in the other, in the other way. Yeah, okay. Should stick to my conventions. Okay, that's it. And, uh, well, we have asymptotic expressions. We don't have explicit expressions for these functions, but we have asymptotic expressions, so I can use these asymptotic expressions to evaluate this, this limit. Okay, and then uh, the situation is uh, simplified by, by this relation. RLO is just RLI, so this I will also use. So I have here, what do I get here? So this is limit r star to minus infinity, or let me write it in this way. 
I write down this, uh, this determinant. So this is RLI d by dr star RLO, and this is RLI complex conjugate, right? Minus RLO, which is RLI complex conjugate, d by dr star RLI. And I have to take this, let me just write it in this way, or r star 2 minus infinity. And on the other side, well, uh, for RLI and RLD, RLO, I don't have asymptotic expressions for r star 2 plus infinity. But if I assume that I express my RLI in this expression, in this form, then I can use the asymptotics for these functions. So I use this expression now for the right-hand side. So RLI is AL RLD plus BL RL up, and RL up is RLD complex conjugate. D by D R star, and now just the complex conjugate of this here. AL bar RLD bar plus BL bar RLD. So now I need a bigger bracket because then comes the other term. So this is minus, uh, now what, uh, let me see, uh, the whole thing um, uh, uh, complex conjugated, right? This is just the complex conjugate of this here. So it is AL bar, RLD bar plus BL bar RLD times d by dr star al rld plus bl rld bar. And this is now to be taken at the other end of our domain of definition. Okay? And for this, I can use the asymptotic expressions. So rli is asymptotically e to the minus i, and so on e to the minus i omega r star over c. And if I take the derivative of the complex conjugate, I get i omega over c, and then e to the i omega r star over c. Okay? And because omega is real, these two terms cancel. Yeah? If omega would be complex, if it had an imaginary part different from zero, then these two terms would not kill each other. Yeah? You have to be careful when you calculate quasi-normal modes. This rule does not hold. And this calculation of the Wronskian would be different for quasi-normal modes, actually. OK, uh, this was this term. Now comes this term, which is just a complex conjugate of this. So this is uh, minus e to the plus i omega r star over c, and another minus sign, i omega over c, because it's i complex conjugated is minus i, e to the minus i omega r star c, and also here the exponential functions cancel. Then I have to take the limit r star to minus infinity, but there is no r star anymore. Yeah, the r star has canceled, so I don't have to take any limit. So what do I have on the other side? On the other side, I have AL, RLD. RLD is e to the minus i, omega r star over c, then plus BL. Oh, now I have a problem with the space, e to the i. Uh, that's a complex conjugate. It's e to the plus i, omega r star over c. Hmm, where do I write this? Uh, okay, that's a multiplication sign, yeah? Oops. So um, then the derivative, it is uh, this term now, right? The derivative of the complex conjugate of this here. So this is AL bar. AL bar, the complex conjugate has a plus. If I take the derivative, I get plus i omega over c e to the i omega r star over c. And uh, here, if I take the complex conjugate, I get a minus i omega 
GL bar I omega over C. And the complex conjugate has a minus in the exponent, e to the minus i omega r star over c. So this was the first bracket. And then the second bracket is a complex conjugate of this here. So it is minus, let me see if I can squeeze this in the remaining space, e to the i omega r star over c plus bl bar e to the minus i omega r star c. And the complex conjugate of this here, this is gives a minus i, minus al i omega over c e to the minus i omega r star over c. Uh, this i complex conjugated gives another minus sign, so I have plus bl i omega over c e to the plus i over C, uh, not there, here, and then the square bracket, and here still I need the limit at the moment, I'll start to plus infinity. Okay, the left-hand side looks very nice. This is just 2i omega over C, period. 2i omega over C. On the right-hand side I still have some more complicated terms, so this gives an AL absolute squared. with an i omega over c, and the two exponential functions kill each other. Then let's take the term, uh, the other term with the al absolute. This gives minus times minus gives plus, and exactly the same term, right? So it gives two times this term. Then the terms where I get a bl squared, BL absolute squared. This gives here a minus I omega over C, and the exponential functions kill each other. Minus I omega over C. And here the same thing. Again, minus I omega over C. So also this term comes twice. And then I have the two terms where an A hits a B. So this gives what? Let me see. Uh, AL BL bar with a minus i omega c e to the minus i. And the same term comes here with a plus. Yeah? AL BL bar. These two terms together, minus sign, minus sign gives plus sign, and the rest is the same. So these two terms kill each other. And the same thing here. Uh, this was the uh, ALBL bar, then comes the BLAL bar. This comes with plus i omega over c times exponential twice. And here BAL bar minus i omega c exponential twice. So the rest is zero, and we are already done. So I can divide by 2i omega over c, and I get 1 is AL bar squared minus BL bar squared. Simple equation. Yeah, that's what I wanted to derive. So as I said, I cannot determine the A and the B L uh, these complex numbers really individually, but I know that this simple relation ha holds. And with the help of this simple relation, I can now discuss the, the, yeah, the balance equation for the scattering problem. So let's consider a scattering problem. What is a scattering problem? So in a scattering problem, we send something in from infinity. So this is what we call the, the down mode. Yeah, we have a down mode, we send it in. Part of it comes back, this is the up mode, and part of it goes to the horizon, that's the in mode. And the, that the assumption is that we don't have an out mode. Nothing is supposed to come out of the black hole. Yeah? So we have no out mode. So we have uh, a balance between the in mode and the up and the down mode. And we have now this relation between the two things. Well, at least we know something about the coefficients. So we have, our, we have a solution, uh, ZL. Oh, wait a minute, I called it Z, right? I now, I now wrote L here, excuse me. Last time I wrote Z, right? Is that true? I think I wrote Z. 
Yeah. Sorry, I, well, actually, uh, in parallel, we have another course <laughs> here running at the university uh, where we do uh, quantum mechanics and, uh, and general relativity. And there we also discuss the Reggio Wheeler equation. And there we use the capital L for this function. Sorry, I've confused this now because I looked in the notes from the other course in order to prepare this. So, uh, yeah, excuse me. So, uh, in order to fit this to what we have done last time, please replace the capital R everywhere with a capital Z. <laughs> Sorry for this. I, uh, yeah, should I stick now to R or should I write that? Uh, Maybe, if, maybe if for now I, I stick to I stick to R. Yeah, but in the written notes I will write that again. Sorry for this. Is yeah, <laughs> uh, you shouldn't uh, should try to uh, keep uh, separate things separate. Yes. Uh, so um, no out modes. This means we have a solution, some R L, which is uh, some multiple of the in mode. So there will be a coefficient. Let's call it C I. Yeah. So this is uh, 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 the mode which we are considering. And this, is, uh, this must be, of course, a linear combination of the up and the down mode. So it must be CD, RLD, plus C up, RL up. And now we have an expression for this here. We know that this is AL, RLD, plus BL, RL up. And RLD and RL up are linearly independent, so we can compare coefficients. So what is, is this clear what this, uh, what this describes? So we have here our potential. We send something in. That's the down mode. Part of it will come back. That's the up mode. And part of it will go to the black hole. That's the in mode. And there's no out mode. Nothing is coming out of the black hole. Yeah? So uh, what we have is um, this thing is a linear combination of these two. That's what I've written in the first line. And I consider something which is a multiple with some coefficient ci of the rli. Then this equation has to hold. And uh, now we can compare coefficients. So this means that cli al is cld. And uh, cli bl is uh, CL should always, always uh, no, yeah, anyway, yeah, they should have an index L, but uh, D, CL, I, B, L, uh, here I am, uh, CL, D, CL, U. In addition, one should also write an, an index omega. Yes, it depends also on omega, of course. This is quite essential, actually, but I think we have enough indices. <coughs> okay, and uh, yeah. Uh, this is, uh, uh, this is almost enough in order to derive that, uh, the, the result I want to derive. We just introduce now some notation. Well, something is coming in, so this is given. The CLD is given. CLD given. And a scattering problem. is to determine the CL uh, up and CL in. Yeah? I'm a little confused with the second relation. Uh, CL CLU. CL, this is nonsense. Uh, this is it, right? I just can compare the coefficient of the RLU. Yes, sorry. Yeah, yeah that's it. So, so CLI, this is a complex number, CLI divided by CLD is a complex number. If I take the absolute square, the ratio, then this gives me the, yeah, the percentage of my incoming, uh, incoming wave which uh, goes to the horizon. Yeah? So this is by definition the so-called uh, transmission coefficient. TL. This is the definition. Yeah? This is what one calls the transmission coefficient. So it tells me how much of my incoming, this means downgoing, coming from infinity down, of my incoming wave, how much of this is actually uh, able to penetrate the, the barrier, yeah? to overcome the potential barrier, and to go into the black hole. This is uh, this relation. And uh, well, that's now, this is not a big surprise. So for the CL up to CLD, 
we introduce something similar. This is a portion which is reflected back. Yeah, up means it comes back uh, to an observer at infinity. That's what one calls the reflection coefficient, RL reflection. Uh, yeah, reflection coefficient. And uh, well, it's one of the most important problems of um, yeah of black hole theory to determine these things as function of omega as functions of omega. There are no simple formulas for this, but there's a very simple formula which we, uh, which gives the sum of the two things, and that's what I want to derive. So this implies that. TL plus RL is what? Let's see. TL is CLI squared over CLD squared. CLI squared over CLD squared. And the RL is CLU squared over CLD squared. And well, CLI is CLD or, or CLI divided by CLD is 1 over A. So the first term is 1 over A. And the second, CLU divided by CLD. Ah, yeah, I have to take the quotient of these two things. CLU divided by CLD is BL over AL, right? So this is plus BL over AL. And now we have this relation, this nice relation. BL squared is AL squared plus 1. So this is AL squared 1 plus BL squared was AL squared minus 1. We have derived it there. So the whole thing is 1. And that's what you, what you would wish. This should be the result of a well-posed, reasonable scattering problem. Yeah? Everything what you send in is either sent to the, um, uh, to, the, to the horizon, it goes through the barrier, or it is reflected back. The sum of the two things should be one. That's what you expect. So this implies in particular because uh, TL and RL are defined as squares of something, absolute squares of something. So they cannot be negative. Yeah? So they must be positive, and the sum is 1. So this implies, in particular, that TL is between 0 and 1, and RL is between 0 and 1. And this means there is no superradiance. Yeah, this uh, this uh, statement here. This means that what is reflected is less than what you send into the system. So you have no superradiance. Yeah, why is this remarkable? Why is it worth being mentioned? You might say, well, this goes without saying. Yeah, it should be this way. Other, other, any other thing would be quite crazy. But actually, if you do the same calculation for a rotating black hole, that's a Kerr metric, or if you do it for a charged black hole, which is a Kerr Newman, uh, this is uh, the Reiser Nordstrom metric. Kerr Newman is a combination of both. Then you will find that this relation is no longer true, that actually you can have super radiance. Yeah? So if you send something into a Kerr black hole, what is blown back towards you is more than what you have sent in. Or at least you can arrange this. It's not always the case, but for appropriate, for appropriate initial condition, it might happen that you get more back. And this is a, yeah, this is a, a kind of strange situation, right? Because uh, this um, uh, yeah, can be used, at least uh, theoretically, to produce uh, a yeah, kind of, um, yeah, of, a, of a catastrophic process, which is called the, the uh, black hole bomb. Yeah, it was, <laughs> was invented by Press and Tolkolsky in the 80s. They called it the black hole bomb. The idea is, I take a black hole where I do have super radiance, so it may not be a Schwarzschild black hole. It must be Kerr or Reiser Nordström or Kerr Newman. And you surround it with mirrors, yeah? And then you send something in. 
And what you get back is more than that. And then it is reflected back from the mirror. And you get again more than we had before. And so the whole thing blows up and uh, it would explode. Yeah? Of course, you may, ask myself, you may ask me, how should I surround a black hole with a mirror? That's, uh, of course, a, a high, uh, complicated technological problem. But at least in principle, this, uh, this situation happens with, uh, with these black holes, that you, yeah, that you can have these um, yeah, somewhat counterintuitive um, situations. In the case of the Kerr space-time, I think at least some of you are familiar with the, with the Kerr metric, so I may say a few words about this. The Kerr metric has a region which is called the ergo region. Yeah? This is a region where particles, massive particles, can have negative energies. And this is uh, the source of this, uh, of this situation. You can also uh, uh, do some, uh, yeah, some similar process to the super radiance process with the help of particles, and it's called the Penrose process. You may throw a particle into a Kerr black hole. In the ergo region, it breaks into two constituents, one with negative energy, one with positive energy. The one with positive energy escapes back. The one with negative energy goes into the black hole. And because you have energy conservation, the energy of the particle which comes back is bigger because the negative thing is, is, is subtracted, right? It's bigger than what you have sent in. So this is a way in which you could use a Kerr black hole as a, yeah, as a power plant. There was a famous paper by Roger Penrose, Nature paper in the late 60s, and this process is called the Penrose process. And what, we are, what I've mentioned here, this super radiance phenomenon with the Kerr metric is just uh, the analog at the level of waves. Yeah, it does not only work with particles, it also works with waves. You need either this ergo region, which the Schwarzschild space-time doesn't have, uh, or you need uh, charges, then it also works. Yeah? You can construct something similar to the Penrose process with charged particles, then it's called the christodoulou ruffini process, and you can extract from a charged black hole energy by throwing charged particles into it. And there's also an analog at the, at the level of waves for, for this, so also charged black holes can have super radiance. Nice question. Hmm? So I presume that in Kerr space-time we consume the energy uh, from, the, from the rotation of a black hole by this process, right? So it's yeah. rotating slowly. And what do we consume in the case of Ress and Nostrum? The charge. The charge. Yes. Yeah. The charge uh, goes down, yes. But how can it go down when we just roll the gravitational waves? Uh, uh, okay. Uh, let me see. Uh, does it? Ah, I think. Ah, does it only work with charged? Uh, so you can do it uh, definitely with a with a complex Klein-Gordon field. This would have a charge, right? Uh, it's, it may be that in the charged case, it only works with charged fields. Yeah. So it would not work with gravitational waves. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Uh, I think that's true. Yeah. Yeah. In the case of particles, it only works with charged particles. Then probably in the case of waves, it will only work with uh, yeah, with uh, charges which have a wave. Yeah, so if you, uh, I think some of you at least are familiar with the Klein-Gordon equation, yeah, which is a wave equation. Which uh, well, in the first course you study on flat space-time. You can also study it on curved space-time. And if a Klein-Gordon field is complex, then it couples to an electromagnetic field. Yeah, by the by the usual minimal coupling procedure, and then you can consider in this in this sense charged scalar fields, but you cannot do this with gravitational waves. Of course, gravitational waves do not carry an electric charge. Yeah, so I think with uh, gravitational waves um, you do not have super radiance with uh, with a Raisin neutron black hole. I'm not quite sure, but but I think this should be true here. Yeah. <coughs> okay. Uh, yeah, the, the only other thing maybe which I uh, maybe should mention is uh, how these things actually depend on omega. So that's not easy. Uh, it can, cannot be easy, easily derived. This formula was re really very simple. Yeah? It was just this property of the Vronsky determinant. Very simple. So if you compare this to any other kind of calculations you can do with these things, it's, uh, it's really surprisingly simple. If you want to calculate these things, then it's not so easy. There are yeah, uh, formulas in terms of series, and uh, yeah, there are, yeah, you have uh, infinite series, and then you get recurrence relations for the coefficients. In, this, uh, in such a setting, you can, uh, you can uh, get hold of these, uh, of these TLs as functions of omega, and then you can plot them as functions of omega. You can, of course, also uh, determine them numerically. So what you get is the following. These TLs 
Uh, by the way, these TLs are, I've, I've called them uh, transmission coefficients. That's one of the names which is usually given to them. They also live on another name. They are also called gray body factors. Where is this name coming from? Well, uh, a black body in thermodynamics is defined as something which absorbs everything. Yeah? If you send radiation onto it and if everything is absorbed, then it's called uh, a black body. So if this TLs would be equal to 1, then the RLs would have to be equal to 0. This means everything would be absorbed and then the black hole would act like a black body. That's not true. The TLs are not equal to 1. And uh, because they deviate from 1, they are called the gray body factors. Yeah? So the black hole is not, a Schwarzschild black hole is not a black body with respect to incoming radiation. It is something like a gray body. It absorbs part of it, but not everything. So in the literature, you often find them under the name of gray body factors. And if you determine them numerically, so they must be between 0 and 0 and 1, you get something like that for different L's. So this is, they go up. They never reach 1 exactly, yeah, but they come out as they come very close to, to L equal 1. So this is for L equals, uh, for the gravitational waves, I should begin with L equal 2. For the scalar and vector waves, I could begin with L equals 0 or L equals 1. So this is L equals 3, L equals 4, L equals 5, and so on. So you see, the bigger the L, yeah, this means the higher the, the potential barrier, uh, the, the closer uh, the, the TLs uh, come, to, come to 1. And also this, uh, this approach, is, approach is one for increasing omega, well, that's easily understood. If you have high, high energy, omega is the energy, yeah? which means, uh, the frequency or the energy with which you send in your waves. Uh, if you have a high energy, then of course it's easier to overcome the potential barrier. So more will be go through the black, to the black hole. So the transmission coefficients will be bigger. So that's easily understood that for big omega, this is bigger than for small omega. And also the, yeah, the, the potential barrier will um, uh, uh, will, uh, will, depend, will depend on the L. So, so actually, uh, if you have high energies, then uh, these things are pretty close to, uh, to one. And then you can say the black hole behaves uh, very similarly to a black body. But actually, it's not a black body. It's a gray body. And uh, we talked briefly last time about Hawking radiation, because uh, I was asked a question about this. Hawking radiation is not precisely black body radiation. It is gray body radiation, yeah? And the deviation from black body radiation is precisely described by these factors here. So that's, uh, uh, that's uh, so this, this, um, yeah, this, this temperature which you associate with a, with a, a black hole in this, in this theory by, uh, of the Hawking radiation, this temperature appears in a, in a radiation law which looks like a, like a black body radiation law, but it is modified by these gray body factors. It's not precisely black body radiation. Okay, so this was what I wanted to say about the perturbation of Schwarzschild black holes. So two things are worth being kept in mind. So one was um, uh, yeah, the modal stability. And the other one was the fact that there's no super radiance for the Schwarzschild black hole. Okay, and then I begin with the last section of this uh, lecture course. This will be about exact wave-like solutions. So we have talked about, for quite some while actually, about uh, perturbation of flat background. This is the formalism in which everything related to observations here on Earth can be safely restricted. Yeah, if gravitational waves arrive here on Earth and if they are detected by some kind of gravitational wave detector, then the linearized theory around flat space is, is always very appropriate. It will cover all these cases. Then we discussed uh, perturbation of Schwarzschild black holes, gravitational waves traveling on Schwarzschild background which is interesting for our knowledge of, for instance, stability and related subject of black holes. And, uh, but this is also uh, not the full uh, nonlinear Einstein theory. It's also a linear theory, right? We linearize, in this case, not around Minkowski spacetime, but around something else. But it's still a linearized theory. So all the aspects which come from the nonlinearity are, uh, yeah, are, um, are ignored in this theory as well. 
And uh, you might ask yourself if uh, actually maybe this is the true theory, the full Einstein gravitational wave theory, the full nonlinear theory might be yeah, qualitatively rather different from what we have derived until now. And in order to investigate this, it's a good idea to see if maybe there are exact solutions which have a wave-like behavior, however idealized they might be. And there are a couple of families of this kind, and that's what I want to discuss in the rest of this course. So I will first discuss a family of plane wave solutions, which are called the Brinkmann waves or the PP waves. And then I will discuss a class of cylindrical waves, which is usually called uh, Einstein-Rosen waves, although it was found by Guido Beck uh, more than 10 years before Einstein and Rosen. So they should be found Beck Einstein-Rosen waves. And I think I won't have time to talk about the Robinson-Trautmann family, but let's see how far we get. Oops. Okay, what is this? Chapter 7? I think 7. Exact wave-like solutions to Einstein's vacuum field equation. The first thing I want to discuss is the Brinkmann waves or PP waves. I will explain this funny, funny name in a minute. So, um, yeah, uh, how do we begin? Uh, if we want to find the solution to Einstein's field equation, uh, you make a certain ansatz, a symmetry ansatz or uh, some other kind of, uh, of geometrical assumptions. And in this case, I think the simplest approach is that you begin with Minkowski spacetime and then you modify it in a certain way that you still have a distinguished family of light-like rays, light-like geodesics, which then in this case give us a direction in which the gravitational wave propagates. So we write Minkowski spacetime, our good old Minkowski spacetime, or the Minkowski metric. Minkowski metric. So what is the Minkowski metric? G mu nu dx mu. That's the way in which it is usually written. Is uh, minus dx zero squared plus dx one squared plus dx two squared plus dx3 squared, right? That's how we usually write it. But uh, for many applications, not just for this, uh, for this topic we are discussing here, for many uh, applications it is, it is useful to introduce coordinates which are not time-like or space-like respectively, but rather light-like. And uh, you can do this very easily if you combine the x0 with one of the spatial coordinates, say with the x3, in such a way that it becomes uh, a combination of two light-like coordinates. And this is what one calls double null coordinates or double light-like coordinates. I used to avoid the word null. It is very often used as uh, synonymous with, uh, with light-like. I always find the word null misleading because there's also a null vector in the sense of zero vector and this is something different, right? 
So the zero vector is, uh, there's only one zero vector in Minkowski space-time, but there's a whole cone of null vectors, yeah, of light-like vectors, and these two things should not be confused. And in particular, if you speak to mathematicians, which uh, if you tell them, tell them about a null vector, they of course think this is a null vector of the vector space, there's a zero vector, so you would, uh, you would very often cause confusion. So I usually say light-like instead of null, but uh, in, for this family of, or for this coordinate system, it, it, is, uh, it is just common to call them double null coordinates. So we le you leave the x1 and the x2, but you combine the other two. I call them u and v. I have to look up where the plus sign is. So I call um, x0. <coughs> uh, so the double null coordinates are x1, x2, u, and v. And well, x1 and x2 uh, are the ones which we already have. And u and v are defined in, x, in terms of x0 and x3. So x0 is 1 over root 2 b plus u, and x3 is 1 over root 2 b minus u. Where the meaning of the 1 over root 2 is, of course, that these things should be, should be normalized. And uh, then you can, uh, well, I will in a minute uh, re-express the metric in terms of these new coordinates. But let's just draw the diagram first. So x1 and x2 are perpendicular to the plane. I don't draw them. Here I have x3. Here I have x0. So I write now x3 as v minus u. So this would be the v-axis. This is positive. And this would be the u-axis, right? Under 45 degrees. So then I have precisely this, this transformation law. Yes, x3 has a positive v component and a negative u component. And uh, x0 has positive u and positive v component. Yes, I think it's correct with the orientation of the axis. So then, of course, we have, uh, well, from this expression, we have dx0 is uh, 1 over root squared dv plus du, and um, dx3 is 1 over root squared dv minus du, du. And if I insert this, then I have for my Minkowski metric the following. It is dx1 squared plus dx2 squared. With these two things, nothing happens. And then I get plus dx3 squared. This gives plus 1 half dv squared minus 2 dv du. This, as always, means symmetrized tensor product. Yeah? So it means dv tensor du plus du tensor dv. And this gives plus du squared. And then I have minus dx0 squared minus 1 half dv squared plus 2 dv du plus du squared. And if I have uh, inserted all signs correctly, yes, I think I have. This goes away, and this goes away. And I just end up with an expression which is actually shorter than the old one. dx1 squared dx2 squared minus dv du. I know it comes once, and another time it comes with a 2. So now you see that, which is what is also clear from the picture, that v and u are indeed null coordinates. They are light-like coordinates. So we have g u u. There's no d u squared. So g u u is 0. And g v v is also 0, because there's no g v squared. E, uh, U and V are light like coordinates or null coordinates. And that's the reason why this representation is called, uh, he has a double null coordinate uh, representation. 
Okay, of course, we are not interested in Minkowski space, so that's our starting point. Now we want to modify this. We want to get something which describes waves. And we have the idea that maybe also in the full theory, the waves may propagate at the speed of light. At, uh, so they may be given by, uh, by a vector field. The propagation direction may be described by a vector field which is light-like. So we modify this now in a way that one of these two uh, families of rays remains light-like, but the other one does not. And we introduce a time dependence so that we really have something which changes with time. And uh, now modify, modify this in a way that, yeah, which one should remain uh, uh, light-like at say V? Remains light-like. So this will be the direction in which our gravitational waves then propagate. Of course, at the moment, we are not allowed to speak of gravitational waves, but we will arrange things in a way that it will have something to do with gravitational waves. Modify this in a way that V remains light-like, but U does not. And that the metric becomes time-dependent. Of course, if it's not time dependent, then it cannot describe wave like motion. Well, and the easiest way is to add a term which does not affect this statement, but it is allowed to modify this statement. So, what we will introduce is something proportional to du squared. Yeah, we will introduce something proportional to du squared and this will give us a desired time dependence. So the ansatz for the metric is dx1 squared, nothing happens here. dx2 squared, nothing happens here. And this term, this term, nothing happens. And now we get a new term. And there comes a coefficient, which I call capital H. This is very common to call this capital H. It may depend on xy, x2, and on u, but not on v, times du squared. And because of this u dependence, look, u is this here. u is, um, yeah, you see, yeah, you see it from the picture, you see. u is, uh, yeah, it's a linear combination of x0 and x3, right? So if you add these two things together, now if you take the difference, x0 minus x3 with a certain prefactor, this gives u, right? x0 minus x3, so it depends, it becomes time dependent, yeah? So this is something which depends on, it's not necessarily sinusoidal, yeah, so I don't specify the way in which it depends on you. So it's not necessarily a wave in the sense that it is harmonic, that it goes up and down like a, like a sine function. But it is something which depends on time. This U plays the role of the time now uh, in a way that, uh, there, that it gives a certain profile. Yeah, and with this profile, then the wave moves. So this, um, this general form of the metric, this is called this form of the metric. We have not, not yet uh, solved the field equation. Yeah, so it's just the general ansatz for the metric of the metric is called the Brinkmann wave. Or a PP wave. And PP stands for parallel, no, um, uh, plane fronted with parallel rays. Rays. Yeah, so here are two Ps, plane fronted with parallel rays, and that's where the, this abbreviation PP comes from. So the first person who considered metrics of this form was this gentleman by the name of Brinkmann. He did this already in the 1920s, in 24, I think. But this was completely ignored by the physics community, by the relativity community, because the paper appeared, no, 25. It appeared in a mathematical journal, and uh, yeah, uh, it was written in a purely mathematical language that this has anything to do with general relativity was not at all clear from the way in which it was presented. And that's the reason why it was uh, ignored for quite a, quite a long time. 
It was then rediscovered by Ehlers and Kunt around 1960, and they introduced this name PP waves. They really discussed the physics in great detail. So I think it's, uh, it is, although they were much later than Brinkmann, it's still justified to, uh, to give some credit to them because they really studied the physics of these things uh, in much greater detail than, than Brinkmann. And, and then it was realized that there was already this old paper, so that this was not a new discovery. And uh, yeah, for, for quite some time, they were in the, in the relativity literature still uh, um, uh, characterized only by the name of PP waves. Now, in the more recent literature, you uh, also find the name Brinkmann waves, which I think is a, is a fair name because he was the first to, to find this. So, uh, plane fronted, where are the planes? Where the planes are, of course, the x1, x2 planes. Yeah? You have planes parallel to this, uh, sorry, orthogonal to the plane which I've drawn here. So, in this plane, in the x0, x3, or the uv plane, that's where the propagation takes place. And in the two directions, two space, uh, spatial direction transfers to this, I have these coordinates x1 and x2. They parameterize planes. X1, X2 are, are parameterized the planes uh, U equal V, uh, uh, yeah, where, um, where U and V are constant. And uh, these, um, this, this is where this first P refers to. And the second one, the parallel rays, these are the V lines. The V lines are still rays, <coughs> uh, they are light like. And actually, they are also geodesics. We will show this in the, in the last worksheet. Which will I distribute it today and uh, distribute today in the evening? And um, actually, they are even more than geodesics. They are even uh, absolutely parallel, so they are covariantly constant in any direction. Yeah, the V lines. They are light-like curves. They are geodesics, and they are parallel uh, along any curve. Yeah. So if I take any any curve in this spacetime, consider the V vector field along this curve, then it is parallel along this curve. It's absolutely parallel. So the covariant derivative is zero in any direction. And that's what we will prove in the, in the worksheet. So this justifies these names. Yeah, parallel rays refers to the fact that d by dv is, a, is an absolute parallel light-like vector field. And plane fronted refers to these, to these planes, x1, x2, parameterized uh, orthogonal to the propagation direction. So until now, we have not yet used the field equation. Yeah? So actually, it's not justified to call them gravitational waves because uh, yeah, they do not satisfy, in general, the, the, wave uh, the, the, the Einstein field equation. But we have to see what condition. Of course, it must be a condition on this function h, right? Everything else is fixed. So the question is, which h do we have to choose in order to satisfy Einstein's vacuum field equation? And for that, we need the Ricci tensor. And, uh, well, actually, in this case, it's not very difficult to calculate the Ricci tensor. Uh, I will not do it in full detail, but I will uh, point out at least some intermediary steps because it's really simple. For the Ricci tensor, you need the Christoffel symbols. And the Christoffel symbols for this metric can be very easily calculated. So, calculate Christoffel symbols. And, of course, as always, uh, it is uh, recommendable to do this uh, via the geodesic equation. Write the geodesic equation and read off the Christoffel symbols. So do not, well, in this case, it uh, would also be not very complicated, very much more complicated to derive it from this formula with the derivatives of the metric coefficients. But with the geodesic equation, it's still sim uh, it's, uh, 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 simpler anyway. Calculate Christoffel symbols from geodesic equation. So what's the geodesic equation? So the geodesic equation in Lagrangian form, that's always the best way to discuss it, is dl, not dx mu dot, minus dl, where dx mu is 0. And l is, is 1 half. That's a conventional factor, g mu nu x mu dot x nu dot. So in our case, we can read the L from this expression, right? So in our case, the L is 1 half, and then big bracket, x1 dot squared plus x2 dot squared 
Dot means derivative with respect to the curve parameter s, of course. Affine parameter s minus 2 u dot v dot plus h, which depends on xy, x2, and u, u dot squared. Yeah, that's our Lagrangian. And we have to calculate the components. So x mu can take uh, the values x1, x2, u, and v. Let's begin with a, with a v. x mu equal v. Then I have d by ds, dl by v dot. Where is the v dot? That's the only v dot. Minus 2 divided by 1 half gives a minus sign. So this is minus u dot. dl by v. Where is the v? Where is the v? h depends only on x1, x2, and u. So there's no v. So minus 0 is 0. That's the first component. Surprisingly simple. And the other ones are not much more complicated. x mu equal u. Then here I get uh, uh, d by ds um, minus v dot. And here I also have a u dot. 2 divided by 1 half uh, gives uh, 1 h u dot. OK? So this was this term. And then minus dl by u, where is the u dependence? Here is the u dependence. Minus dh by the u, here is a 1 half, u dot squared half is 0. That's the second equation. Okay. And then x mu is equal to xa. From now on, I write a, b, and so on for 1 or 2. Yeah, so the capital Latin indices takes the values 1 and 2, uh, 1 or 2. So then I have d by ds. Uh, dl by dxa dot gives an xa dot. An xa dot, uh, no other xa dot. Minus dl by dxa, here I have an xa. Minus dh by dxa u dot squared half is equal to 0. OK, now let's rearrange these, a little, these terms a little bit, and then we can read off all the gammas. So this is just u double dot is equal to 0. Yeah? So I combine all these equations now in order to write the geodesic, the components of the geodesic, geodesic equation, and then I can read off the, uh, uh, yeah, the, the Christoffel symbols. Here I have, if I take this to the other side, I get a v double dot. Then I get here, u double dot is 0. So this gives nothing. But this gives a derivative. So this gives minus dh by dxa, xa dot, minus dh by du, u dot. Uh, wait a minute. Uh, u dot is missing. Yes, thank you. I was wondering why <laughs> I had only terms linear in the velocities. I must get something quadratic in the velocities. Minus dh by the u, u dot squared half is zero. So this gives, are the signs correct? Let me see. No, I have taken this to the other side, and this becomes a plus, right? I began with v double dot with a plus sign, so I took everything to the other side. And then this term here gives a minus sign here. That looks good. And the last one, the last one is x a double dot is, uh, yeah, uh, that's what is written there. dh by dx a u dot squared half is 0. And now I can read the gammas, right? So this here, for instance, must be gamma uh, a u. Yeah? This here must be gamma u u with an upper index v, and so on. So we see that only very few gammas are actually different from 0. So the non-zero Christoffel symbols are what? Well, let's begin with this here. 
This is a gamma u u, and the upper index is a v. So this is minus dh u. And then we have this term here. Uh, no, wait a minute. In the, yes, yes, it's true. Yes, minus, yeah. Uh, then we have a gamma with an upper v and a uh, lower index a and u. And this is, actually this comes, uh, this comes twice, right? Because uh, I have the symmetrized tensor product, so this is one half. One half dh. And the first one is also with the one half factor. Uh, no, this is u dot squared. Ah, ah, I overlooked this, thank you. <laughs> yes, <laughs> very good. Yes, you're right. Uh, and here I get one gamma, this is gamma with an upper index a, and here I have u u, and this is minus dh by dx a, and again I have a one half, right? That's it. All the other Christoffel symbols are zero. And uh, let me check, just to make sure that I haven't, make a, haven't made a calculational error. Let's see, minus one half du, yes, that's true. Uh, Vua, yes, one half. Uh, there was a minus. Uh, yes, I forgot this minus sign, right? There was a minus. And here there's also a minus. Uh, wait a minute, what about the indices? Ah, okay, ah, here I have to be careful. Uh, I, should have, I should have been careful here already. Uh, dh, dxa, yes, uh, well, yeah, if I, if I just calculate this in the way I get it, then I get what I've written here. But this is not a, wait a minute, this is upstairs, this is downstairs, this is correct. Let me see, dh by dxa. H by no 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 it is this down index of course yeah the index is up here and it is down here so actually in order to be in agreement with our index conventions I should have introduced the Kronecker here yeah it's the same thing <laughs> as before yeah if you just uh, uh, calculate the sum over the over b then it's exactly the thing what what we had before but now it's in agreement with our index rule the a is an upper index here then it should also be an upper index in this term. Yeah, that's the reason why I introduced this delta term, and I should also do this here. This is just to, yeah, uh, to be in agreement with, uh, with the standard conventions. So if you calculate the terms where you insert for A either 1 or B, then you get exactly what I've written before. Yeah? So in this sense it was correct what was written there before. But uh, it's never, never a good idea to have one index down and uh, in one expression and then you add something to it where the same index is, is, is up. Yeah, so you should avoid situations like that. So we know all the gammas. From all the gammas we can calculate the Ricci tensor, right? I will not do this on the board now, but I think you know what is to do, right? So the Ricci tensor is something with a, a derivative of gamma, derivative of gamma, and then two products of gammas, right? And we have to calculate this from this expression. And you find that there's only one component of the Ricci tensor which is non-zero. Component of Ricci. And this is a UU component. The UU component is one half. Yeah, the Laplacian of H. Yeah, delta A B D A, or I've written D by D X A. But it's the same, yeah. I always use this notation. D with an index A down means D by D X A. D B H. So this is the usual three as you uh, by the two-dimensional Laplacian, yeah? Two-dimensional. Standard Euclidean Laplacian. So, well, what is Einstein's field equation? The vacuum field equation is Ricci equals zero if we neglect the cosmological constant. So this is satisfied if and only if our function h uh, yeah, is a harmonic function, if the Laplacian applied to h is zero. 
So this is a general ansatz for such a, such a family of metrics with uh, distinguished plane fronted uh, yeah, surfaces and parallel rays, light like parallel rays. And if this coefficient h, this coefficient function h here satisfies this differential equation, then the vacuum field equation is satisfied. So the vacuum field equation, Einstein's vacuum field equation is satisfied if the Laplacian apply to H is zero. And if you assume this, then we have something which may be interpreted as a gravitational wave. Yeah? It's a solution to the Einstein's vacuum field equation. So I have only vacuum, um, uh, vacuum situation. So only a gravitational field, no sources. And uh, yeah, this, uh, this metric is a metric which describes a certain propagation with the speed of light in the direction of these V-lines. And uh, yeah, you have a certain profile function. H as a function of U may, uh, yeah, may uh, uh, this, uh, gives you a certain profile of the thing which propagates, and that would be to interpret it as a gravitational wave. And it's a gravitational wave, not in the sense that it's a small perturbation of something. It's an exact solution to Einstein's vacuum field equation. It's a full nonlinear theory. And now comes the miracle. The miracle is that the differential equation you have to solve is linear. Yeah? Einstein's field equation in general is a nonlinear field equation. But with this special ansatz, it boils down to a linear field equation. So you can apply the superposition principle to these kind of solutions. Yeah, if you have one family of, um, uh, if you have one, uh, uh, one metric of this form with a certain function h, and another function with another, uh, another metric with another function h, h1 and h2, and both of them satisfy the Laplace equation, then also the sum, of course, satisfies the Laplace equation. So the sum of the two things is again a solution. So we have the superposition principle for this family of solutions, although the solution satisfies a full nonlinear theory. Yeah? That's what makes these things so nice and so, yeah, so easily tractable. Actually, these metrics can be uh, discussed and uh, fully evaluated uh, with much easier methods than most other exact solutions uh, we know about. Yeah, this is, you see the gammas, they are, they are really simple. Only, only a few of them are different from zero. Uh, if you do not assume the field equation, if you assume that the Ricci tensor may be non-zero, you have this very simple form for the Ricci tensor. So it's really a very, very simple family of metrics. Actually, it has a, has, a high, has a high symmetry. It has, um, uh, in addition to the ones we can read directly from the metric, it has, um, it has additional hidden symmetry. That's what, ma what makes it so, so simple. Okay, uh, actually, to make the history a little bit more complicated, uh, so I said that this family of metrics was introduced by Brinkmann in 25. These particular solutions, where you have the vacuum field equations, uh, um, uh, taken into account uh, was discussed in 26, I think, in a paper uh, where the authors did not know about uh, <laughs> um, Brinkmann, yes, in 26, by Baldwin and Jeffrey. And they called these plane gravitational waves. So these particular solutions where this is satisfied are called plane gravitational waves. This more general family is called PP waves, yeah, or Brinkmann waves. So this is, um, yeah, this is the sources or references. So relevant ones are uh, Brinkmann, 24. I will give the precise references in the, in the lecture notes. And then Baldwin and Jeffrey. Jeffrey, I think, is that the spelling? Yes, I think so. Uh, no, 25 was this, and this was 26. And then comes Elas and Kunt. There are several papers by them, actually. Elas and Kunt. This was around 1960. I think the first paper was 59, and then, then came, came other ones. 
So, yeah, we have now the opportunity to study gravitational waves in terms of exact solutions. So the interesting question, one of the first uh, uh, questions is, uh, do they also show something analogous to the cross mode and the plus mode, which we have studied for the linearized waves? Yeah? Or is this something which is peculiar for this linearization scheme? So do we have uh, yeah, uh, this, uh, this property that if I uh, put test masses in the way of my wave, that they are deformed as we had this in the, in the plus mode and the cross modes? First question. Uh, second question, um, how do these things focus? Um, yeah, uh, rays, particles, or uh, par rays of particles, or, or rays of light. So, um, uh, does this give interesting nonlinear effects? Yeah, you would would expect if you have a nonlinear theory that you might get some some very strong focusing effects, which you do not uh, have in the in the linear theory. Actually, in the linear way, well, what do I mean by focusing effects? Uh, you know, from ordinary optics, you, you know what a caustic is, right? So if, uh, so if light is, is made converged by a lens or something like that, then it forms what is called a caustic. So, so rays, uh, well, either they really intersect, this would be something like, a, like an ideal focal point, or at least they come close to each other. They have a first order contact. Yeah, so this gives these, these, these shapes of, of, of caustics, which you can see in a cup of coffee, for instance. Yeah? So that you have these, uh, these things where the rays become tangent to each other. So uh, does something like that happen in, uh, in these gravitational wave space? And this can, does not happen, this focusing does not happen in the, in the linearized theory. Yeah, the linearized theory perturbs the light cones only slightly, but they yeah, preserve essentially the shapes they have in Minkowski space time. They have a slight perturbations. So there's no real focusing in the sense that focal lines are produced or something like that. And the question is, do these nonlinear waves, do they show focusing effects? And that's something I would certainly, I would certainly, want, uh, I certainly want to derive. And the answer is yes. Actually, these, in the, the focusing properties are completely different from the, uh, from the nonlinear, uh, from, the, from the linearized uh, theory. But uh, for both these topics, I will need the, uh, uh, I will have to know something about geodesics. Uh, I have written the Christoffel symbols already. Now it would be good if I would find my notes. Uh, so this ends where I am now, but I wanted to go on actually. <laughs> Let me see. Sorry. Fortunately, I have it on my laptop. Uh, okay, I will do this not for the, for the full class, for an arbitrary function, H, which satisfies this differential equation, but for a restricted class, because then it will become fairly simple. Uh, where do I have this? Oops. So I will assume that the H depends on X1 and X2 in a particular way, and I will do the calculation only for this subclass. And for this, I will actually introduce something like a plus mode and a cross mode, and I will discuss the focusing properties. Here we are, no. Lectures, yes. Okay, here we are, very good. That I have done, this I have also done. Yes, yes. So I will con consider the special case. So, oops. That my function h. is a function little h, which depends only on u. And then, uh, did I write this with a delta? Yes, I think that's the best way of writing it. Oops, here we are. Uh, uh, yes, that's it, yeah. H a b of u, x a 
xb. So it's quadratic in the coordinates uh, x1 and x2. Yeah? That's a particular ansatz. Then, then uh, this differential equation, the field equation, then the field equation was delta A delta B H equals zero. So let's see what this gives. So I get delta A B D A. And then I differentiate this with respect to X B. Then I get two H B C of U X C, right? Yeah. This is a derivative of this expression with respect to X B. I have to call uh, this index C instead of A because A is already used. So I read the C instead of the A and then differentiate with respect to X B. Then you get twice because of the symmetry, this, uh, this coefficient with an X C. And then I get if I calculate this derivative to dAB, this gives a chronica delta AC, right? HBC of U delta CA. So this is now the C becomes an A. This is 2 delta AB, HAB. Let's write the other way around. It's symmetric, of course. Yeah, HAB is symmetric because this is symmetric. So if you would invent an anti-symmetric part of HAB, it would be cancelled by multiplying with XA, XB, right? So without loss of generality, we assume that HBA is symmetric uh, of U. And yeah, that's it. So, and this is zero, right? This is zero. So what does this mean? It means that this matrix HAB, yeah, it's a two by two matrix, that this is trace free, yeah? So HAB is a two by two matrix, the coefficients depend on U, it's symmetric, and the field equation requires it to be symmetric. So the HAB has the following form, it depends on U. So I have some element here, which I call F plus of U, and I have some element here, which I call F cross of U, smelling a red. And then it must be trace-free, so what is here must be the negative of this here, so it must be minus F plus of U. And what is here must be the same as this, because the matrix is symmetric. So you must have here, again, F cross of U. Yeah? And you see the same structure as we had, uh, everything, yes, it depends on U, everything depends on U. So it's determined by two functions. One gives, uh, uh, this is in the x1, x2 plane, right? A and B uh, are coordinates standing for uh, the values a, uh, x1 and x2. So in this plane, we, uh, this, this matrix lives, and it depends on U, which is a coordinate transverse to it. And uh, we have, um, yeah, this is a 1-1 one, one component. That's a, the 2-2 two, two component, and they are equal up to sign. This is a 1-2 component, and the 2-1 component, they are the same. So it's the same structure as we had for the, for the plus modes and the cross mode. So you have, again, uh, this is something which is uh, yeah, uh, aligned with the axis, with the 1 and 2 axis, and this is one which is rotated under 45 degrees. So we have, uh, yeah, also in this case, one calls this a plus. Yeah, mode is maybe not the correct word, because we don't assume a, a periodic, yeah, a, a sinusoidal dependence on the time. So uh, yeah, maybe I should not call it the plus mode, but it is uh, something which is related to the plus sign, which we had for the plus mode, and the other thing with the cross mode. Yeah? So you may, in part, the, the dependence on U is completely arbitrary, right? The field equation doesn't require any particular property of the U dependence. So you can give any shape. Yeah? So you could use, uh, you could consider the U as a kind of a time coordinate. And then here your h for fixed x1 and x2 as a function of u could be anything. Yeah? So you could, you could do something sinusoidal, but you could also do something like a pulse, yeah? which then propagates, or whatever else you like. And uh, well, if you do something sinusoidal, then the word uh, mode would, of course, be justified. Then you could call this a plus mode and a cross mode. And uh, now I have to calculate for this particular case the, uh, the geodesics. But I think I won't do this today. Uh, yes, I think I do this next time. Won't, it will take maybe half an hour or so. 
And then we can discuss, um, yeah, first of all, the behavior of these things, what they are doing with freely falling particles. Yeah, that was the idea of uh, detection of gravitational waves. We put freely falling particles somewhere and we see what the wave is doing with it. That's how we evaluated the, uh, the effect of, uh, uh, of uh, gravitational waves in the linearized theory. And now we can do this in the full theory for this particular uh, shape of the, of the, of the uh, of the metric. This is the first thing which we will do and the second thing is we will see what happens with, uh, with light. How, does, how do these waves focus light waves? What do they do with a light cone? And they do something very interesting. So this gives, uh, yeah, there's a famous hand drawing by Roger Penrose, how the light cones in these space times look like. Maybe some of you have seen this before and I will, I will give you at least an idea how this picture was produced and what the, what the metric is doing with the light cone, but I will do this next time. So I will calculate the geodesic equation for this kind of metric and discuss it in some time. But I will do this not on Friday because I will not be able to be with you on Friday, unfortunately, but I will do it in one week from now. And on Friday I have to ask you to amuse yourselves, among yourselves, with the, with the, with the exercises. So I will give the, the solutions to maybe to Pavel. Will, be, will you be around on Friday? Yes, okay. So then, then you can, can discuss the, the solutions by yourself. Okay, so we will meet again next Monday. Okay, see you then.